what's up gang welcome to the lab girl the lab girl circle welcome to another study session with me the lab girl if you are here today then that means that you are ready to have another study session with me we completed fixation now we're on to processing so today is a 30 minute study session with me and we are going to get into the beginning of processing and hopefully you guys can walk away with some valuable information that will help you guys uh, understand processing a lot more and also to help you pass the ASCP. That is the goal. These study sessions are for uh, future histotechs, uh, current histotechs who are in the process of studying the ACP and also students who may be um, taking their tests, you know, after they graduate. And these are some great study tools that you can listen to or watch that will be able to assist you in studying for the ASCP. Now, the first thing is, if you guys can hear me, if you're joining me today, please just put a thumbs up in the chat or let me know, yes, that you can hear me in the comment. That way I know that my audio is great and we can definitely go ahead and get started with processing study session with me and also to grab your books that's the that's the key that's the most important thing make sure you grab your book And thank you, Landon, for letting me know that you can hear me. I really appreciate it. I hope you're doing good, Landon. Welcome to another one of my videos. I haven't, you know, seen you in the chat for quite some time, so I hope you're doing well. Um, welcome to the study session with me. If this is your first time joining uh, my study session, I just started these study sessions, and um, I did fixation so you can definitely check that out there will be on the playlist but welcome to um the study session with me hope you're doing good all right guys let's go ahead and get into some things before we go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes first of all i do want to tell you guys um with the study session with me um on your way in make sure that you hit the thumbs up button and get ready to take some notes. Um, also, just let YouTube know that you enjoy these study sessions with me. That would be awesome. Share this content with other fellow students, histotechs, or someone, you know, or just, you know, rewatch it for yourself so that way, or listen to it. Um, that way you'll be able to, you know, help yourself uh, pass the ASCP. So and if you guys got any suggestions on future study sessions, Feel free to let me know. You guys know my content information. I'll tell you guys all that at the end of the live. Um, but if you got any suggestions as far as my study sessions go, something you may want to touch on, feel free to leave it in the comments here. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit later. I always read you guys' comments and I always always try my best to make sure I write you guys back and get back to you. And I hope you guys have your books because we're going to start processing. And let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, to the study session. I see you guys in here. Thank you so much for joining. Let's go ahead and get started. You can ask me any questions. Drop them in the comment section down below and then at the end we'll get to it but we're going to actually have um a q a or slash pop quiz a little bit later so just get ready for that all right so let's go ahead and get into processing all right so there are some definitions that i want you guys to walk away with for this first part one of processing that's going to be dehydration that's going to be clearing if um infiltration paraffin embedding so 
what I like to do is at the beginning of your of your Frida Carson book, there are a list of terms that Frida would like for you guys to just know the definition of and understand what these things do. So we're only going to touch on a few of them today. So the first will be dehydration um, of the tissue. So I'm going to the glossary. And it's good that you guys use your glossary in your um, Frida Carson book. It will be at the back of your book. Maybe you have a newer book and it's at the front. Um, but let's go to dehydration just so we can go ahead and get an idea exactly what dehydration means in the um, processing part of, you know, the step of processing. All right, so dehydration is the removal of water from tissue. Um, and we'll go over some dehydrating reagents later in the in the stream so dehydration is the removal of water from tissue think of yourself as being dehydrated and you need water so dehydration is the removal of water from tissue the next definition i would like for you guys to um, understand would be clearing in the processing chapter so i'm going to go to clearing And clearing is the process of replacing the alcohol, the dehydrating agent, with the reagent that is miscible with paraffin. Most clearing agents leave the tissue transparent, hence the name clearing agent. So the dehydration is first, and then you want to clear or remove the alcohol. So process of replacing the alcohol with the dehydrating agent agent so that is clearing so we'll learn some clearing um reagents as well and the next one will be infiltration let's go to infiltration infiltration is uh, as in paraffin, um, permeating, spreading of flooring throughout the tissue. Infiltration is known as impregnation. So we have dehydration, we have clearing, and we have infiltration. And this is all during processing. And of course, embedding, which would be um, embedding of the wax or you know paraffin um that is definitely a part of the processing you know how you have the paraffin chambers or the the wax that's a part of the processor so that's going to be infiltration the tissue gets infiltrated with the paraffin embedded medium so those are just the few i have here for you guys just to make sure that you understand um the process or the beginning portion of processing of course there's other definitions that you guys um, definitely need to read which would be universal solvent carbo wax cross-section decalcification ion exchange chelating agent and miscible so those are some other definitions that would be great for you guys just to understand exactly what happens during the processing portion whenever you are processing the tissue after fixation. All right. So for your first flashcard, let's go ahead and go to your first flashcard. Flashcard number one. I broke this down to... Um, four flash uh, four flashcard sections i try to you know break it up because processing probably won't take as long as fix uh, as fixation did so this is going to be your first flashcard and you can definitely add to your flashcards throughout you know the chapter which is a really great thing so if you got your notes you got your flashcard you got something you're writing with so this would be great to start with so let's go ahead and start with 
your flashcards for dehydration. Okay, so what are your dehydration or what are your dehydrants? So let's go ahead and get to the Frida Carson book. And I'm just going to read just the first half uh, of the first part of your book. It says processing is usually considered to include dehydration, clearing, and infiltration. This chapter will also discuss embedding decalcification and frozen sections as special areas of processing. Both the fixative and the processing method should be chosen either before or immediately after removal of tissue as surgery or autopsy. The choice of processing method may influence the choice of fixative. For example, when frozen sections are indicated, the tissue is not usually fixed. However, when processing, processing for routine studies, the choice of fixative depends primarily on the preference of the pathologist. Okay. So we won't spend too much time on the on that part, but for those who are new to histology or you are still in school, whenever we get a frozen section, those are normally received fresh. They're not in, they're not fixed in formalin. They don't go on the processor. They normally come either on a dampened uh, gauze or a dampened tefla, and that's normally dampened with saline. So this tissue is def is this tissue is primarily cut off the body at, you know, OR and shipped to us fresh. So this tissue does not go on the processor. But if I can give you guys a visual, uh, if I can give you guys a visual, what happens is, no, and this is, it, it depends on the lab, okay? So once we do the frozen section, then after the frozen section, if the lab would like paraffin, um, portions of that fresh specimen, whatever por whatever portion um, will be used for the frozen section, which was inside of a cryostat. You guys may have seen a cryostat in your lab, or maybe you took a tour to the frozen section room, or you have one in your classroom. Um, that frozen part will be done on fresh tissue first, and then some, and then most either a once the once the part um, has been frozen, um, that'll be melted, you know, melted down. And then you can actually use pieces to go ahead and, uh, use for paraffin embedding, which would then go on the processor. So that's why I said, however, when processing for routine studies, the choice of fixative depends primarily on the preference of the pathologist. So frozen tissue sections are not fixed. So that's something you could put, you know, in your notes doesn't matter where, but frozen tissue is fresh tissue that is not fixed. And let's go ahead and get into your dehydration, okay? So dehydration. Dehydration means removal of water, a process necessary to prepare the tissue for embedding in a non-aqueous medium such as paraffin, solidian, or some plastics. These embedded media will not infiltrate tissue that contains water. All right, so something I want you to put on your, your index card would be the results. This results in hard and brittle. Oh, let me go back. However, the excessive dehydration bound water may be removed in a non-additive reaction. This results in hard and brittle tissue that is difficult to section. If dehydration is incomplete, the clearing agent will not act properly and soft, mushy blocks will be the result. Incomplete dehydration accounts for the vast majority of processing problems. Dehydration agents act to remove water in two ways. Some reagents are hydrophilic, which are water loving and attract water from the tissue, how, um, whereas other reagents dehydrate by repeated dilution of the aqueous tissue fluids. Okay, so there should be a picture um, in your book that shows you when something was not dehydrated. Well, if something was dehydrated poorly or dehydration was incomplete. You may see in your lab where a lot of breast tissue may be, um, may have incomplete either fixation or incomplete dehydration. But you'll see when something when something appears like very mushy in the block after you know you've embedded it, that means that the dehydration was incomplete 
or clear or was not cleared sufficiently. So infiltration of the paraffin was poor. And that's normally the white area in the center of the block. If it looks like raw or soft, when I say raw, I just mean like something that's not fully processed and it in a soft, that area was not well infiltrated with the paraffin and it will not be able to be sectioned. So it may have to be reprocessed again. So that is for your dehydration. So basically removal of water. A process necessary to prepare the tissue for embedding in a non-aqueous medium such as paraffin, solidian, and some plastic. So we'll get to that a little bit later. All right. So your four alcohols for dehydration is going to be most dehydrating reagents are alcohols. Most of the absolute alcohols contain some water, frequently used as much as 1% or 2%. So we're going to do four alcohols. The first one's going to be ethanol, but your books say ethyl alcohol or ethanol. That's going to be your first alcohol. So in this category, you could put four alcohols to dehydrate. Number one would be ethanol. Or you could think of it as drinking alcohol, right? So ethyl alcohol is a clear, colorless, flammable liquid. Because it is drinking alcohol, ethyl alcohol is strictly controlled by the federal government and troublesome record keeping is required if the alcohol is purchased tax-free. Ethyl alcohol is a reliable and fast acting and is probably the best of the dehydrants. So you could put in your notes to help you remember, number one, four alcohols, ethanol, and you could put parentheses, think of a drinking alcohol. It is the best of all the dehydrants. So that's another thing you want to make sure that you put that. To save time, the dehydration process is frequently begun with 95% ethanol followed by 100% ethanol. And you can look in your book. There's going to be some processing um, charts and processing times. You definitely want to study those to make sure that you understand like the different changes of alcohols and the grades of alcohols and how many changes of um clearing and how many changes of infiltration and every it depends on the process run for small biopsies or large biopsies um for brains for whole mounts for whatever that your lab may be running for gout anything that your lab may be running the process and times could differ so for this case you want to make sure you put number one is going to be your ethanol long periods of dehydration and absolute alcohol should be avoided because this causes excessive shrinkage and hardening of the tissue. So as we're going through these um, key points, most definitely go ahead and drop a comment um, in the comment section if you have any questions for me or another fellow uh, person can actually answer in the, in the comment section as well, just in case I don't see it right away. All right, so another thing you want to put is that um, this product is known as denatured alcohol or reagent alcohol, and it, and it has more pronounced odor than pure ethanol. So let me just go ahead and go back to that category. So it says, if laboratory personnel do not wish to undertake the record-keeping demand when using pure tax-free ethyl alcohol, an ethanol that has been made unfit for human consumption usually by adding methanol and or isopropanol may be substituted this product is known as denatured alcohol or reagent alcohol and it has more pronounced odor than pure ethanol ethyl alcohol if used alone is toxic with permissible exposure limit of a thousand ppm it's also flammable when denatured with methanol or isopropanol, it becomes much more toxic. If disposed of in the sanitary sewer system, it must not exceed a 24% solution. So in this case with the ethanol, the key points um, is to make sure that you know that it's toxic. You want to make sure that you um, understand that it is 
known as denatured alcohol, uh, denatured alcohol or reagent alcohol if it's um, if methanol is added. Also, too, that is the most reliable and the best of the dehydrants. It is hydrophilic and therefore mixes with water as well as with many organic solvents in all proportions. If time permits, ethyl alcohol should be used in sequence of solutions that gradually increase in concentration. And again, to save time, the dehydration process is frequently began with the 95% ethanol followed by absolute alcohol. So it starts at a lower concentration, then slowly increases to 100% um, ethanol. And ethanol, you can put in parentheses to help you remember drinking alcohol. All right, so the next alcohol would be your methanol or methyl alcohol. So methanol is flammable, clear, colorless reagent with a slightly unpleasant odor. It's rarely used alone for dehydration, but it can be used like ethanol. Its primary use has to has been for the fixation of blood smears. So number two, methyl or methanol is primary use is for blood smears. So if that's a question on the ASCP, what is methanol primary, primarily used for? Blood smears. Um, it's poisonous. And these are things that you can just know just to know, but I don't think it's going to be probably on the ASCP. But uh, methanol is poisonous. It is broken down to formaldehyde by the liver and access to formaldehyde on the body. This is just, um, you know, the safety part of it. Overexposure can cause blindness and even death. Methanol has a PEL of 200 ppm and care should be taken to protect the skin for absor uh, for, from absor absorption of the solution. All right, so the next alcohol, so that's number three, it will be isopropanol. Isopropanol is an excellent substitute for ethanol and processing tissue for paraffin and bedding. However, many stains such as eosin are insoluble in isopropanol. Therefore, it cannot be substituted for ethanol in the preparation of staining solutions. Isopropanol also cannot be used in solidian technique because nitrocellulose is insoluble in it. Um... It is never totally absolute because it contains about 1% water. Therefore, a slight amount of water also remains in the tissue. Isopropanol alcohol is mildly irritating to the eyes, nose, and throat. Has a PEL of 400. It's toxic. It's a flammable reagent. For drain disposal, keep the concentration below 10% because it's considered ignitable at higher concentrations. Okay, so the third one is going to be isopropanol. And for that flashcard, just make sure you put it's an excellent substitute for ethanol and processing tissue for paraffin embedding. But many stains such as eosin are insoluble in isopropanol. Therefore, it cannot be substituted for ethanol in the preparation of staining solutions. So, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what, what I think I'm reading is that if it says that it's excellent for a substitute for ethanol and processing tissue for paraffin embedding, so doing the processing part, right? But when it comes to the staining, however, many stains such as eosin are insoluble in isopropanol, therefore it cannot be substituted for ethanol in the preparation of staining solutions. So probably when it's time to stain for H&E, and you don't have any um, ethanol, then that won't be a good substitute. That's how I'm reading that, okay? And your last alcohol, so you can put number four, there's four alcohols for dehydration. Number four would be 
uh, butanol. I'm sorry, guys. I'm having some technical difficulties. Hold on one moment. Okay, thank you guys for being patient. It was my internet. Okay, so for your fourth alcohol, it's going to be butanol. And for butanol, this is definitely a flashcard. It's going to be butanol is good for dehydrating plant and animal material. It has a pronounced odor and a low dehydrating power. Therefore, long periods are required for dehydration with butanol. It is an excellent dehydrant when slower processing procedures are needed and butanol causes less shrinkage and hardening than ethanol. And the PPM is 100. So there definitely will probably be some type of question on your ASCP. Um, just say if they ask you what, um, what dehydrant is best for plants or animal material, that's going to be butanol. So remember those four um alcohols remember those four those four choices okay all right so let's go ahead and go into acetone let's see here all right so flashcard number two let's go ahead and talk about acetone too as far as your alcohol so acetone is a very rapid acting and less expensive than some of the other dehydrants so you're going to have your all your alcohols and then you're going to have your acetone so what i will probably do as well as a key thing for your flashcard just make sure that you put all of your a's dehydrant and you're going to put all of your a's and all of your A's are alcohols, is your category. So you're going to do your ethanol, your methanol, your isopropanol, and your butanol. And then now you have your acetone. So acetone is very rapid, active, and less expensive. According to some laboratories, it causes excessive shrinkage, which we probably went over that back in processing so acetone equals shrinkage um shrinkage sorry guys that's <laughs> that is my uh southern side okay 
uh, it causes excessive shrinkage. And if acetone is exposed to the air, it will absorb water. Acetone is very volatile and maintaining proper solution levels can be a problem in open processors. So just read that flashpoint, read your safety part. That's really important. But as far as for the acetone, just know that it is that it can be used as a dehydrant, but it causes excessive shrinkage. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and go to flashcard number two. Thank you guys for joining me uh, in the live today for your study session. Um, please do a thumbs up as you're coming in to the to the live. That would be great. Okay. All right, so your flashcard number two is going to be your universal solvents. The term universal solvents is, um, is used in histology, and it says denotes those reagents that avoid the use of two solutions. Universal solvents perform both the dehydrating and clearing steps. So that's a flashcard. Universal solvents are both dehydrating and clearing so let's talk about what those would be and then let me go ahead and type the universal solvent solvents in so we got for universal solvents we got deoxane we have Butan, uh, okay. Tertiary butanol. I could be saying that wrong. So T E R T I A R Y butanol, which again, these are the three that does both. Okay. And then we have. Tetrahydrofurin, T E T, that's a long word, R A H Y D R O F U R A N. So we're going to save that. So universal solvents are deoxane, I'm just call it TB. How about that? So that's a good, uh, if you can't pronounce it, just call it TB. And then the tetrahydrofurin. So let's go ahead and talk about your deoxane. These are the three that would do, these three solutions or these three reagents will do both your dehydrating and clearing. That's why they're called universal solvents. So for deoxane, deoxane produces less shrinkage. <laughs> deoxane produces less shrinkage during dehydration than ethanol. So that's, that's a key point. Even at the long periods in deoxane, tissue does not show undesirable changes in consistency or in subsequent staining properties. Deoxane is a faster dehydrant than ethanol, but must be used in large volumes. It frequently contains water, and if water is left in the tissue, deoxane may allow as much as 50% shrinkage during infiltration. It is expensive, but may be reclaimed for reuse by treating used solution in 18 to 22 hours with an um, anhydrous calcium chloride or calcium oxide. And it's, because of its toxicity, deoxane is really used today. Okay, so you got your, your PEL information, but the main thing to take away from deoxane would be that is both. It's going to be used for clearing and it's going to be used for dehydration it produces less shrinkage and during dehydration than ethanol. Um, and also, too, it's a faster dehydrant than ethanol, but must be used in larger volumes. All right, so the next one will be um, TB, Tateri Butanol. It's, it's, um, it's a odorous, expensive, and tends to solidify at room temperature. So you want to just read about that. And then the next one is the tetrahydrofurin. It's miscible with the lower alcohols, water, either chloroform, um, water, ether, chloroform, acetone, benzene, toluene, xylene, melted paraffin, 
it is much the same as deoxane in properties and use but unlike deoxane and tetrahydroforan is not a cumulative toxin so make sure that you understand that it acts rapidly without causing excessive shrinkage and hardening and it is the best of the universal solvents it is very useful in the reprocessing of inadequately dehydrated and clear tissue so the main thing to take away about number three in the universal solvents, it is probably the best out of all three. And it acts rapidly without causing excessive shrinkage, shrinkage and hardening. So that's a good thing to know about that right there. All right, so let's go ahead and go into clearing. All right, so far as your clearing, the process of clearing, which is your next flashcard, all right, so clearing, the process of clearing was originally termed as such because the reagents used for this step have a high index of refraction and will render the tissue transparent. Clear agents must be miscible with both the dehydration agent and the infiltration medium, which most frequently is paraffin. Clear agents are sometimes referred to as dealkoholization agents. Their primary purpose is to remove the alcohol used for dehydration and to make the tissue receptive to the infiltration medium. An adequate clearing will be followed by an adequate infiltration of tissue with the embedded medium. As seen in the incomplete dehydration, there's a picture in your book, which was um, 2.1 if you have the Frida Carson book, uh, third edition. It says, as seen in that incomplete dehydration picture, the resulting tissue is soft and mushy. Prolonged periods in many of the clearing agents will produce hard, brittle tissue. So let's go ahead and talk about your clearing reagents. Your first clearing reagent will be xylene. Xylene is the most widely used clearing agent, and although substitutes have been proposed, few have found widespread acceptance. Prolonged treatment with xylene should be avoided as tissue tends to become overhardened. Fibrous, muscular, central nervous system, or, car or cartilage tissues are especially affected by the hardening properties of this hydrocarbon. Xylene is relative, relatively rapid in displacing alcohol and is miscible with the paraffin. However, it is rather intolerant of any water left in the tissue. Tissue that is adequately dehydrated and then cleared with xylene becomes transparent. This property of xylene may be used to determine the, in, to determine the adequacy of clearing before embedding the tissue and corrective action may be taken when indicated. Xylene turns cloudy in the presence of water. If the xylene on the tissue processor is ever noted to be cloudy, the reagent should be changed immediately. Now, this is talking about on the processor but um let's just talk about whenever you are dehydrating and clearing at the um at your h and e counter i'm not sure if you guys whenever you've you know rinsed your tissue and then you you know you go into your your alcohols and then you're leading into your xylene sometimes if you don't rinse good or if you don't drain your alcohols good by the time you actually get into your xylene it could turn cloudy. I'm pretty sure we've all seen this and we've all been there and, and done that. So that means that there were still alcohols carrying over into the xylene. So that can definitely happen. So that's what that cloudy look, that's what you know they're, they're talking about. But this is actually inside the processor. So what happens is if you look at your, your book and you look at the picture, which is 2.2, you'll see how the tissue will look when there's water still present, you know, within the H&E. That's why it's really important whenever you guys are studying these pictures, 
you may see a picture that has, you know, incomplete dehydration and you're thinking that it's something to do with that with the hematoxin or eosin. So just be really careful with not getting a picture mixed up. You're thinking that it has something to do, like maybe with special stains. Um, so make sure you study your pictures because it'll show you if you most likely if you get a picture and they're talking about, you know, could you tell me what's wrong with this picture? And if if they say something about like uh, incomplete dehydration or incomplete uh, or infiltration is poor, um, that's probably mostly going to be the answer because it's probably a processing, um, probably a processing problem with the tissue and not a staining problem. So uh, that was xylene. So that's your first flashcard for or flashcard number four uh, or flashcard actually number one well, clearing number three. For your for your xylene, um, the next clearing agent will be toluene. How I remember these because I thought of the enes. We use xylene every day, but when do we normally use toluene, or when do we ever we ever use benzene? Um, so I try to go with the E N E. That's how I remember the clearing agents. Xylene, we know it's a, we should already know that xylene is a clearing agent. So on your on your ASCP test, just think of the E N E's. Clearing, xylene, clearing, toluene, clearing, benzene. So now your goal is to remember what each of them, you know, just like one or two things of how you can remember what they're good for, or you know, which one is the best. So xylene is like the widely used one, which we all know. So the next one's gonna be toluene. Toluene does not overharden tissue as much as xylene. In fact, tissue may be may remain in toluene overnight without harm. It is considered by many labs um, workers to be the best of the aromatic hydrocarbon clearing agents, a group of reagents that includes xylene, toluene, and benzene. Um, let's see here. So 2.2, your picture in your Frida Carson book, it says, um, she found that the match of the universal problem with uneven H and E staining and poor nuclear um, chromatin patterns, which is in your book 2.2, was a result of incomplete clearing. She related the incomplete clearing to moisture in the clearing reagent from such causes as excessive laboratory humidity or evaporation of the fixative solution with subsequent condensation on the processor pot or chamber lid, and then the contamination of succeeding reagents. So those are things that you probably really won't have any contact with. Uh, if you are a histotech, unless you are a lab tech and you're watching this and you may become a histotech. Um, so this is just where the incomplete dehydration and things can happen during the process in part. So you want to definitely read that just to have that knowledge. The next um, clearing will be benzene. So you want to know that benzene is a fast acting and does not over harden tissue. So just like toluene, it doesn't over harden tissue as much as xylene. Benzene is very fast acting and does not over harden tissue like xylene. However, it hardens muscle, tendon, and uterus more than toluene. Benzene evaporates rapidly from the paraffin bath. Therefore, the paraffin used for infiltration does not require rotation and changing as frequently as other clearing agents. Again, you guys who watch me may not even work too closely with the processor, so you may not know the information, but those are just good things to know. But as far as the ASCP, you just need to know what the clearing agents are, okay? The next one's gonna be chloroform. Chloroform leaves tissue less brittle than xylene. So you wanna put chloroform. It penetrates slowly, making clearing a longer process. And I'll let you read again the rest of that, but just for the main flashcard, just you want to make sure you know chloroform is a clearing agent. You can remember that by C clearing, C chloroform. All right, acetone, another clearing agent. Acetone is not mentioned in the literature as a clearing agent. However, because acetone has a very low boiling point, of 58 degrees Celsius, tissue clear with acetone will show more shrinkage than those that have been cleared with xylene. So that's just something good to know. Essential oils, 
you can read that part i don't really think that will pop up on the um on the ascp but just read it just so you know the the info um this is important here limonene reagents xylene substitute that's important for you guys to know that they may ask you what is a good xylene substitute or what is known as a xylene substitute so that would be limonene a way you can remember it think of lemon you can think of limousine i don't know whatever you guys feel like is a good way for you to remember it but xylene limonene these things really rhyme benzene toline they should be very easy for you guys to really remember on the scp um so just read about limonene and why it's, you know what made it you know a, a xylene substitute another one is the alpha phatic hydrocarbons which is another xylene substitute um you guys need to read about the advantages and disadvantages of that i'll leave that up to you guys and the universal solvents the universal solvents used for clearing include deoxane tb which i shorten that so and tetrahydrofuran so you're going to definitely you know read over that so those are your three flashcards that's really important and your other clearing agents you can read about that is carbon um tetrachloride carbon bisulfide those are things that you can just read on. i'm not really sure if that may be appearing on the ascp but i don't remember it so you guys can let me know if, if you've already taken ascp you're you know watching this or listening to this later did you get any type of clearing questions that has something to do with um those other clearing things not the main ones that you know we're currently used to all right so let's go ahead and go to your flashcard number four which is infiltration um, infiltration after dehydration and clearing tissue after dehydration and clearing so that's the two steps now tissue must be in tissue must be infiltrated with the supporting medium this medium generally referred to as an embedding medium holds the cells and intracellular structures in their proper relationship while thin sections are cut with paraffin especially, it is important that the tissue be dehydrated and cleared very well or the tissue will not be infiltrated completely. If the infiltration medium cannot completely replace the clearing agent, then problems will be noted on the H&E stain sections. Complete dehydration and clearing are not as critical with some other infiltration medium. The most used infiltration medium we guys, we all know is paraffin. That's the most used. So you want to make sure that you go ahead and put that on your flashcard number four for under infiltration. It would be the most used would be paraffin. So paraffin wax remains the most popular medium because large numbers of tissue blocks may be processed in a comparatively short time. Serial sections are easily obtained and routine and most special staining can be done easily. Paraffin is a fairly inert mixture of hydrocarbons produced by the cracking of petroleum. Let's see if if there's a definition i don't think there's a definition of paraffin inside the um inside your book no it's not i was looking for that okay um the commercial paraffins are marketed for embedding con contains various additives such as beeswax reduces crystal size and increases stickiness and adhesion rubber reduces brittleness increases stickiness and makes the formation of ribbons during sectioning easier and other waxes produce smooth texture and smaller crystal size and plastics increase hardness and support these additives also enhance the ability of paraffin compounds to provide support for hard tissues ribbons are formed when the first section cut adheres to the microtone knife blade and each subsequent section adheres to the edge of the section immediately preceding it each new section cut will push the preceding section away from the knife edge. All right, here's a flashcard point. 
in your book. In choosing the paraffin for use, several factors must be considered. As the melting point increases, the paraffin becomes harder and provides better support for hard tissue. Thus, thinner sections can be obtained, but ribboning becomes more difficult. As the melting point decreases, the wax becomes softer and provides less support for hard tissues. Thin sections also become more difficult to obtain, but ribboning becomes easier. And that's just something that you want to know about the melting point with paraffin because I'm pretty sure that that would definitely be on the ASCP about your melting point. Um, for most IHC techniques that can be done on paraffin embedded tissue, paraffins with lower melting points have become popular because heat may inactivate the antigens. Um, paraffin with melting points of 55 degrees Celsius to 58 degrees Celsius is commonly used for routine work. So that's really important. That's will most definitely probably be on your ASCP. What is the melting point of paraffin? And that's going to be 55 degrees Celsius to 58 degrees Celsius. Throughout the week, I would definitely be giving you guys um, more ASCP uh, questions, quizzes, pop quizzes. So that would definitely probably be one of the, the questions. Um, this seems to be the best compromise for providing good support for most tissue, yet allowing good ribboning and ability to obtain thin sections. Tissue should remain in paraffin the shortest time necessary for good infiltration because exposure to prolonged heat causes shrinking and hardening. The supply of melted paraffin should be kept 2 degrees to 4 degrees Celsius above the melting point because tissue exposed to overheated paraffin during infiltration will over hardening. That's definitely going to be on the ASCP. Paraffin infiltration is greatly aided by vacuum. However, vacuum and heat should be applied cautiously when processing very small specimens because it frequently results in overhardening. So you definitely want to read that portion of your book. Um, another great thing it says large and fatty tissues will not be processed adequately on shorter cycles. If a schedule that gives good process on larger specimens is used on biopsy specimens, it will result in hard friable tissues that are difficult to section or that will contain microtomy effects, microtomy artifacts. Now in the next session of your, in the next section of your um, book, you're going to have some protocols. I'm going to leave the protocols up to you guys for you guys to actually like study those. Make sure you look at protocol number one, protocol number two, look at all the protocols. And then throughout the week, I will um, probably post a protocol video or maybe on the next slide we'll put a protocol up that way you guys can actually um get the hang of reading the protocol and exactly you know what's the dehydrant what's the clearing what's the infiltration um and wh what exactly is doing on a closed uh, routine processor and a solution you actually have another protocol for rapid processing of biopsy specimens which are you know the smaller specimens all right, so let's see here. We're going to stop right there because we're going into a little bit over or almost an hour. So we're going to do, we're going to go over the community tab questions. And let's just go over your answers really fast. If you guys are enjoying this live, make sure, or this study session, make sure you guys are thumbs up and thumbs up this live okay and let's go ahead and go to some of the questions that i asked you guys on the community tab all right so one of the questions let me just go back to okay so this is one of the questions that were asked um to you guys when used for clearing cedarwood oil must be followed by alcohol, xylene, or universal solvent? And the cedarwood oil, let me go to your universal solvents. Okay. 
So when used for clearance, cedar wood oil must be followed by alcohol, xylene, or universal solvent. So cedar wood oil must be followed by xylene. And 75% of you guys got that correct. The next one is... A small lab with variable daily process workload should change reagents daily, weekly, or based on predetermined threshold, and it's going to be based on predetermined threshold. So 86% of you guys got that correct. And we haven't gotten to decal, but I did ask a decal question. It says heat in the solution is a good method of increasing the rate of decalcification, true or false. And the answer is false. And 67% of you guys got that correct. It says heat generated during decalcification may cause tissue destruction and loss of cellular detail as well as uh, sustainability. So you guys, you guys did really well. And I asked you a question um, during the embedding process, which is bone section should be embedded parallel to the long axis of the block. True or false? The answer is false. And 86% of you guys got that correct, which is microtomy will be easier if the bone sections are embedded diagonally in the, in the block. So we'll get to um, in the next, in part two, We'll go into some protocols, but I really want you guys to really read over the protocols because you actually have to read that and understand that yourselves. But we'll get into the water-soluble waxes, solidium, plastics, uh, epoxy resins, agar and gelatin, and troubleshooting, which is like a really big thing. And then we'll get into the specimen embedding the specimen orientation which you know that bone question was a part of the specimen embedding orientation so i probably shouldn't have jumped so far to that because you guys we need to just lead up to the embedding the specimen orientation part so we'll get into that later but let's go ahead and we don't have a lot of time so i'm just going to bring up something i want you guys to work on and that would be this right here